and welcome to the news for the week of Monday, the 22nd of August. I am once again joined by the amazing Maxi. Maxi, say hello. Hello, everyone. It's ya boy. I, you know, that's better than the last few intros <laughs> that you've done, but it's. Hey, I feel like it went, it, went worse, it went worse in the wrong direction, you know? <laughs> Well, let's, that's enough banter. Let's get right on to the news. Obviously, we posted last week's news literally the day that the Embracer thing happened, which is them buying more stuff. We covered previously the whole Tomb Raider acquisition Deus Ex thing. Uh, but Embracer is running around and buying everything, and they've now bought uh, the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit's rights in their entirety. They bought limited run games, games Tripwire, and a few other game companies. Maxi. You've done a lot of research into this. Yeah, so luckily for us, you know, we're a little bit late to the party in terms of reporting, but it gives us the ability to kind of do a little bit more research. So it's come out that Embracer on the 18th of August spent roughly $770 million on a large number of same-day acquisitions. They haven't disclosed how much of what was spent on what and where and everything like that, but here's a quick breakdown. So like you mentioned, the IP rights to Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit Literary Works by J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh -huh. So... So basically what this means is they can make movies, books, games, TV shows, whatever they want based on the books by J.R.R. Tolkien. But they cannot use movie facets or assets. So as an example, if they release a King of Men game and the main character Aragorn looks like Viggo Mortensen, it's an instant lawsuit because they don't have the rights to that. But they can recast him, change him, race swap him, whatever they want to do. And all of that stuff is is legally, they're allowed to do that kind of so stuff. They so could, they could theoretically <laughs> reboot the entire franchise and do another three movies. They could. Yeah, 100% okay. they can. They could do their own version of it in the same way that with how there's two Shining movies. Got it. So now the price of that has been undisclosed, as has everything else, but I would say a decent chunk of that $770 million would be towards Absolutely. that. Because the, the, the Tolkien ring. family has been very protective over JR's works. So um, I would not be surprised if it was a good third to two thirds worth of that funding. Some other games, like you mentioned already, Tripwire Interactive, the guys who make the Killing Floor and the Rising Storm series. Tuxedo Labs, they did Teardown. Down, the Minecraft-esque destruction physics game. Um, good fun. Sing Tricks. So this was an interesting one. I had to look these guys up. This is the company that patented the technology behind the Guitar Hero franchise. So if you're um... 30 years old, you probably remember that game being popular. So they were the guys who first created that technology that's sitting that sits behind the Guitar Hero franchise, which is pretty big. And the fact that they were acquired makes me think, I don't know, maybe there's something in the works in the future. And you're not just talking about game devs either. One of the companies that was acquired on the 18th was Limited Run. These are the guys Guys that are almost solely responsible for the technology that allows old retro games to be ported across to modern platforms that you play on today. Yeah, it, it, you need to also understand that there's a lot more here than you don't realize for people mm. watching that, you know, the, there's a lot of like titles we're naming. But yeah, it's it's a lot more than it sounds like, because, you know, if a game has a game to uh, rights to this, you have a right to this universe and a bunch of other stuff. Um, books, everything attached to it could possibly be hooked yeah, on. Yeah, books, just, comics, TV shows, Avatar The so Last Airbender, much. Stranger yeah. Things, Umbrella Academy, Hellboy. Like, we're not ta just talking about video games. Now, moving forward, we're going to talk about the KOTOR remake. It was having a lot of issues. We covered the news on it. Uh, basically, two of the game's lead devs were fired, uh, and now the release has been pushed back to 2025. Uh, has now been taken away from Aspire completely and moved up to one of Saber Interactive's Eastern European and Studios, uh, which, you know, is it Aspire? Aspire? I think it's Aspire. Uh, but the Embracer group that just bought it just basically owns the rights to this, and they've decided that, hey, I own both of these things now. I'm moving development to a different company. Obviously, you no longer have the ability to do this, and it's a no-brainer that someone taking a game that's like two-thirds done or half-baked or whatever you want to call it and moving it to a completely new studio who doesn't understand the flow of things or how the code works or how the databases work or how anything works, the structure of all that is bad. It never ends well. There's been very few, I can't think of any off the top of my head situations where a game has fumbled back and forth like that so crazily and then ends up succeeding. So it looks like KOTOR might just completely fail in this regard of a remake, or they might just have to completely start over with what they've been given from the ground up because, uh, it's being juggled and it's not, it was already doing bad. It, it doesn't bode well. And it might even go from 2025 to like 2029 or 2030 at this point. That's just the long and the short of it. In my opinion is that it was doing bad. It's now being juggled. It's to a company that has no idea what they're doing with it because they didn't design it. And who knows? 
Next up, we've got Sony possibly facing up to 5 billion British pounds sterling. I think that's their actual currency name uh, being uh, being charged in legal claims over basically them overcharging for pretty much everything in the Great Britain. Uh, I was just informed that this is the case in a lot of countries with it being completely inconsistent. I had to do some research on that personally to understand where this was coming from. But essentially, it alleges that Sony has been overcharging the crap out of people in the United Kingdoms because of its dominance there in the British market to impose unfair terms and conditions on the PlayStation Store where it sells digital games, downloadable content, and subscriptions, including a flat 30% fee for developers that want to sell games on the store, which often results in the prices of digital content being higher than a physical copy of the same title. Steam also does this. This is worth mentioning on Steam for basically any developer in the United States. This was a while back, but it's changed recently. They had to pay 30% as well. I believe it's down to like 20 or 25% of the game does better, but this is standard practice. But the main complaint is that the software in Britain is a lot higher than it is in other countries and that Sony has been abusing this and they want to get between 67 pounds and 560 uh, two pounds per individual member, which could take the cost pulled up to 5 billion uh, if they actually win the lawsuit. Now, Maxi, you were telling me straight up that the same sort of practice happens over in Australia, and I was actually completely blindsided by this, but I want you to tell everyone what you just told me. This is something that I've personally experienced. Um, for the longest time, people in America would say, oh, we purchased games for about $60, and that would translate roughly to a comparison of USD to AUD, right? So a $60 uh -huh. game in USD would be roughly between $75 and $90 um, Australian dollars, you know, depending on uh, on the original price. What I'm starting to see now is that a lot of games are ridiculously expensive on digital storefronts specifically. So as an example, I purchased a PlayStation 5. The only one that I could get was a digital version, which I was fine with because I don't care about downloading digital games. I wanted to try it out. I searched up Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart on the PlayStation 5. It was uh, up there for 135 Australian dollars for the standard edition. That's insane. No and special that's like, edition. What, that's like ninety six and ninety nine dollars ne US, yeah. Nearly a hundred bucks, yes. But the issue was is that I purchased the game because I was like, "Wow, that's really expensive." I uh, googled the game, and I've googled it just now to make sure that my numbers aren't incorrect. You can currently pick up a copy of Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart on the PlayStation Five for sixty five Australian dollars on Amazon. So to prove to you guys, and I'm not kidding, all right? So you see it right there, yeah, sixty five dollars for Ratchet and Clank. Right? Okay. And then quickly come out here. Come out here. This is my apartment, by the way. Hello, cat. And then this is on Ratchet and Clank, but this is on my PS5. This is my PS5. $124 for the standard. That is almost cheaper than the well, actual that's, digital version. Yeah, th that's it's cheap. Not only cheaper, but it's half the price for a physical copy. And this is consistent across a lot of Sony exclusive products. If you're looking at the new God of War Ragnarok to pre-order it right now, it's hundred and thirty dollars. And in the United States, it's not. It's it's like thirty bucks less than that, little less than a hundred, which is what would translate. But it also seems like this is a widespread abuse thing that goes on in Australia. And like you said, it might just be the Commonwealth as a whole, which I didn't know about is that things like iTunes and Nintendo games and digital Nintendo games and all this other stuff, a lot of these publishers are doing the same thing where they're charging like 30 to 50% more than what a lot of other companies and or other countries pay in their respective locations versus just like Australia. Like I was looking at some of the Switch games, like some of the Switch games being like over 130 bucks Australia, but then in the United States, they're like $69.99, which is insane. And, and that's what we had a conversation off recording that you guys didn't see, uh, talking about how I genuinely thought that games in the United States, like the argument is, you know, they've been $60 forever. They should be going up. I'm under the impression that that actually makes sense as far as like the trend with everything else in the U.S. goes. Once the quality is up there, I'm happy to pay whatever it takes. Yeah, right? I'll pay sure. $80 for a game if the game is good. But, and just using recent examples... I don't, I'm not paying $130 for Saints Row. I'm Absolutely not. not. No. And you'll be getting a review of that sometime soon. Uh, it'll be less of a review and more of a what the hell did they do wrong or how did this happen sort of rant. Uh, <laughs> definitely let us know what you thought down below. And it, even if you just want to say hello, Dell or hello, Maxi, comments really help with engagement. So let's get that going.
Next up, we're going to briefly talk about Call of Duty uh, in the sense of Call of Duty and Activision has been plagiarizing a ton of stuff. Now, I was talking to the person who released this skin or the original concept art over on Twitter. His name is Salen. I hope I'm saying that right. He did concept art of a Samoid warrior. He basically talked about it. There is a tweet right here. Essentially, he designed a Samoid in uh, combat tactical armor and then Call of Duty went and absolutely plagiarized it to basically one to one. It was unbelievable how obvious that they just stole from him uh and he got in contacts with them and they did end up saying oh yeah we're gonna take it down sorry because he lawyered up and was like hey uh you you stole this you've designed this you're putting this in your store you're going to make millions of dollars from this and you stole this from me without any credit uh and activision admitted that they were wrong and pulled it from the store and they apologized which was good to see you know and they probably only did that under threat of everyone being pissed at them because this was everywhere it blew up everywhere all over these websites saying that they just plagiarized it super hard. And they were like, yeah, we won't do it again. And then they immediately did it again. <laughs> like, <laughs> not even a week and a half, two weeks later, they got accused of doing it again. And they basically took something from Dr. Disrespect's uh, new Midnight Society game that is coming out. Uh, they basically went and took a character that looks almost identical to it. The Doomsayer. Uh one to one similarities between the two on a lot of cases. It's just extremely obvious that the digital artists or whoever the 3D modelers that Call of Duty Activision uh, has doing this just took a lot of inspiration from this and copied it. I mean, the colors are really close. The skull's really obvious. The the whole, the chest plate armor, you can see the similarities here, especially in the tweet that's on screen right now. It's It's just obvious and it's just... I don't know if this is Activision's fault or the people that they're paying or outsourcing to do this. I don't know if they do this in-house. There's a lot of intricacies in these companies outsourcing certain things. Like a lot of people don't realize that a lot of art that's done for games and a lot of 3D models that are done for games are outsourced to smaller companies and independent contractors located elsewhere in the world because it is way cheaper to do that. I don't know if they were responsible directly for the plagiarism or if this was done from a branch company of a branch company or whatever, but it's obvious that it's happened. And for this to happen twice in such a short time period, I just got to say shame on Activision for not having a higher quality control uh, and to make sure this sort of stuff doesn't happen because the internet saw this and figured it out in 10 seconds. I'm sure there are very many developers in the United States or employees that you could hire that would have noticed the same thing. It also sucked. Like the it art, sucks. The, yeah, you actually look at it. Thing. It's yeah. so much worse. The freaking the the image of the character from Midnight Society looks so badass. Like he's got like the the little threads that are like torn on his yeah. arms, like they're like almost ghillie suit. And then the, the second guy looks like that, like like a character from He Man. Like it, it it's completely it's different, but exactly the same. And you didn't even improve on it. You just made it worse. Yeah, like you can tell you copied it. The chest plate, yeah. or chest plate alone tells me in the skull face. And don't get me wrong, there's been other Skullface characters, but like, come, come on, right? It's just like with the Samoid thing. The Samoid thing was way more blatant and on the nose to the point where they copied the cloth, down to the cloth, man. But it's like, this is just another example of we're just going to steal from everyone and not have any issues. Uh, and there's been a lot of companies that do this. I mean, Fortnite's done it. They've gotten in a lot of trouble for plagiarism. Uh, and it's just mm -hmm. like, guys, you make billions and billions of dollars take the effort to buy some originality because this is just not okay. Anyway, let us know what you think about it. Yeah, I'll end the story, but the yeah, comments down below, just like everything mm -hmm. else. And finally, Maxi, it seems like these stories just keep coming and coming and coming. And, oh God, that's it's not, not the only thing. That's not the right word to use for that. <laughs> and that's insensitive and I apologize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but it seems like sexual harassment is the Duracell bunny of 2022, where it just keeps coming and going. And it's just horrible to read. And now there are massive accusations of Nintendo America's game testers saying they faced years of sexual harassment in Nintendo America. Now, we can't speak for Nintendo Japan because it's a whole different climate. They've got different things. But specifically in Nintendo America, there have been massive accusations of sexual harassment. Maxi, talk about this. 
Yeah, so basically there was a group chat um, on Nintendo's Microsoft Teams server called The Laughing Zone. It was supposed to be this place for just the workers to share memes with one another. You know, we've all been there. We've all worked in an office place. We've got like a group chat that you all just have fun with, you know. Kind of changed when a male translator was added to the group. He posted Reddit screenshots of that classic meme of why Vaporeon was the best Pokemon to have sex with. This um this particular game tester who is is named Hannah in the article, but that's not her real name, was disgusted by the, the elicited descriptions that people were giving, the things they would do to this Pokemon, etc. The conversation then turned to Genshin Impact, which, yikes, um, which then the oh, translator yeah, posted a gift of... that's a whole of... different story. Yeah, no, try, we've openly talked about how disgusting it is that there's sexualization of children in that game. Yeah, so the translator posted a gif of Paimon, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, who was a child character in the game, but then he then went on to talk about how he believes it is okay to be sexually attracted to Paimon, despite the character's childlike appearance, voice, and personality. And that's the clause of, oh, she's a thousand years old, so it's okay. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no, it's not. Just out there, we both agree, Maxie, that's that's messed up. And and look, my opinion on it is, you are technically correct. The character is older than 18 years old, which technically, if you were looking at it just on paper, would make it legal. Yeah, okay. You're still weird. If a character looks like somebody or looks like uh, someone who is not over the age of 18, and we're not talking someone who could be maybe 17 or maybe no, 16. No, this when character you could looks like be, they're 11. Yeah, it's... When you look like you're 11 or you could be driving past an area full of children and see a small child who looks exactly like that, a character that you were professing to be sexually attracted to, you're a weirdo, you're a creep, get some help, okay? Exactly. Hannah screenshotted these comments and attempted to escalate the situation with Aerotech, the staffing company she was contracted with um, while working with Redmond Washington headquarters, and they did basically nothing. They basically said that it was a conversation they had nothing to do with and that staff's opinions are staff um, opinions. Um, she, she was being told that she'd been doing such a good job and they would hate to see anything go bad from this or anything like that and asked her if she genuinely thought that it was worth pushing this any further. Super disappointing. It's just crazy to see this stuff happening even after the whole Activision Blizzard thing with the Blizzard accusations and all the horrible stuff that happened in this company. It's crazy to see that this sort of stuff is still happening and that this is, you know, this is just one claim, but there were a lot of people exposed to this. The worst part is not that it's happening. It, yep. This stuff happens in an environment. Sometimes you make a comment, you make a joke or any or something like that, and it's insensitive and it and it needs to be looked at. Hannah claims that Aerotech management warned her to be less outspoken after she reported the incident. She said that even some of her friends from the work the work group chat blamed her for reporting the incident. And the the only repercussion the translator actually faced was being assigned sexual harassment training. Post a funny, if you work for Nintendo, post a funny Mario meme that you find. You know what I mean? Post a funny edit of a Pikachu or something like that but don't start posting about your sexual fantasies about a character who looks 11 years old and then trying to justify it to the people that you sit across with across with that's just weird that's just weird dude and you need to be stopped and it's worth it's worth clarifying that this isn't nintendo proper this is a company that's hired by nintendo it's like a, mm -hmm. a secondary company but it's still they work for nintendo um but yeah it's 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 absolutely disgusting that you see that it's just systemic at this point, and you just—it seems like every other week we're hearing another example of something of this happening, and then the employees being told to shush, specifically the women. And it's just—it's yeah. messed up, man. It doesn't matter who you are, where you, what you work for, what you do, you know, your gender, your sex. None of that matters. You should not be exposed to this stuff in a professional work environment. And it's just companies need to step up and deal with this more. And I feel like. A lot of the whole the whole company telling her to stop being so vocal about this is because they absolutely didn't want to be blizzarded. And you know what? No, it's good to get it out there. And I encourage anyone that's in a workplace like this that's dealing with this. And I know we don't get the big views that a lot of other people do, but I personally encourage that if you're dealing with any of this sexual harassment stuff, speak up about it, you know, especially in a public forum where people can get outraged about it because you shouldn't put up with it. All right, and that's going to be it for the news today. Uh, obviously, really long episode, a lot of stuff to talk about. Again, with any of the articles, any of your opinions, we do read the comments. I know a lot of YouTubers say that, oh, they read every comment. We actually do, because we don't really get thousands of them. So believe it oh, or yeah. not, like all three of us, Maxi, Godfoot, and myself, do read your comments. You can go back to a lot of our videos. You can see that I've personally favorited them. I reply to a ton of them, especially on the reviews and some of the news is just, Make sure that even if I don't reply, I do read them. Make sure that if you have an opinion, you post it down below. 
And yeah, that's going to be it for the news this week. Uh, I, I also I also went and liked and commented on every single person that commented the word butt in the comment section of our last news video. That's so true. I told you, you guys I would that. do it. And I did it. I did. I think there was like, I think on that video, I think we ended up getting nearly 90 comments or something like that. And a lot of them were butt. I commented on every single one. So I appreciate you guys. Let's do it again, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I will take the moment to do the shout out. So I want to explain this really quick because a lot of people don't understand. And this is worth something that, you know, people that make it to the end of this news, you'll understand. Uh, YouTube's completely based on engagement. And so the reason why we ask for comments is because it doesn't matter if a video gets a ton of views. If you're not getting like any comments down below or anything like that, it doesn't really get pushed as much as you'd think. A lot of times videos that get pushed are completely based on engagement in the comments. Even if it's super negative, any comment whatsoever gets the YouTube algorithm to recognize it. So if you're a fan of the channel and you watch all of our videos and you like the reviews, you like the anything we do, the Let's Plays, anything on the channel, go back through all of our videos. Even if you just leave the word hi or hello or I like bananas or butt or anything like that. Nah, I like bananas. Uh, tell me your favorite fruit in the comments of this video. <laughs> if <laughs> you do you anything give us your comments like on that. all of this important stuff, just I like apples. I like bananas. I like strawberries. That's that's this week's thing. I will like and comment on every single one that has that in it. I promise. Just go back, put anything on any video, and it will help the channel succeed. It lets the, the, the YouTube algorithm know that we are forcing engagement. We're encouraging it. We're having our fans actually do stuff. It makes a big difference. A video with 50 comments versus a video with 150 comments, the views will absolutely skyrocket based on that. A great example is our Evolve video. That is our most watched video on our entire channel now. And most of it is because the comments were so active with people talking about it, it exploded. So yeah, remember that when you watch any video on YouTube, any one of our videos that leaving comments on them, even if they're dumb comments, it helps us tremendously and we appreciate you. And that's going to be it for this news. Thank you so much for watching. And until the next video, this is Delrith and this is Maxi and we'll be seeing you. Bye. Bye.